Hi everybody, my name is Andrea Smith and I'm the facilitator for the Falls Prevention Workshop for the Manitoba Fitness Council. Today we're going to be looking at the terminology around falls and fall reduction. I'm going to help, help you understand some common fall mechanisms. Um, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about fall prevention education components outside of exercise. Um, I want to also discuss briefly how to integrate fall reduction exercises into a fitness class as well as understanding fall reduction techniques and uh, specific exercises that reduce the chance of your participants falling. What I want you to get out of this short workshop is to feel confident in including fall reduction education and exercise. Um, and keep it top of mind when you're working with both a senior population or any population that is fall prone. Everybody has a fall story. Um, two of them that come to mind for me are a gentleman I worked with at the Refit Center who was a hustle bustle, always busy kind of gentleman who was rushing to the library one day, tripped on a piece of sidewalk that had been heaved and fell and broke his kneecap. Now, if that wasn't bad enough, uh, he ended up getting a blood clot, um, which traveled through his body and wrecked some havoc, and he ended up hospitalized. And just from a fall where, you know, we stumble onto our hands and knees, this was a, a serious issue that put him out for months on end. Second fall story is a family member's um, grandfather fell back uh, into his bathroom. He was in an assisted living home and lived with his wife, but just fell backwards, uh, fell into the bathroom, broke his hip. And unfortunately, he went into the hospital and, and didn't come out. Um, and we often hear stories like that. So as much as we think falling is not sometimes that big of a deal, we've, we've fallen lots in our lives, we see kids fall all the time. When it happens to someone who's a senior or who has risk factors for fractures or head injury, uh, we really wanna reduce the number of falls that occur. Luckily, we can do that with fitness. So um, a fall is defined as an event which results in a person coming to rest inadvertently on the ground or floor or other lower level. So I guess the other lower level would be falling off by, or falling downstairs, for instance. A near fall is, is when we kind of lose our balance or trip, uh, but we can regain balance before we actually fall. But these near falls also can cause injury. I don't know if you've ever fallen and you know, caught yourself and you end up with a sore shoulder or a, a sore hand or bumps and bruises. And then lastly, the term fall injury is any injury that results from a fall. And we'll look at some of what those injuries might be. They're not always very serious, but often they can be. The risk factors for falling include people over the age of 65. And in Canada, one in three people over 65 each year falls in Canada. That is an enormous statistic. Women tend to fall more frequently. Uh, people who fear falling are more likely to fall. And so they're, they're, you'd think that they might be extra cautious, but we'll look at what a, a fear cycle looks like in a moment. Those that have underlying health conditions, and that is a huge broad range of chronic conditions, including changes to vision, joints, uh, neurological impairments, metabolic impairments. Side effects uh, can often cause lethargy or dizziness, uh, and uh, some side effects are, um, uh, can potentially uh, add to fall risk. And we'll look quite extensively at a person's environment. Um, people often fall in their homes, that's the most common place to fall, but the community is another uh, place and, and certainly we know in Winnipeg with the snow that is often not well cleared from our sidewalks, being outside is a huge fall risk. Just to note that hospitals and long-term care facilities have very comprehensive fall reduction techniques. Um, if you've ever visited a senior relative in either of those places, especially if that person's prone to fall, you probably would have seen notes on a board or on their, even on their door of their room that suggests that they may need uh, help transferring if they need to go to the washroom. They may, may need two staff members to assist them or one or make sure they have their mobility aid within reach, etc. But uh, falling in long-term care in hospitals is, um, the numbers have been reduced, but it, it's a very serious risk. 
This is the fall cycle I was referring to. So once someone falls, they become fearful of falling again. So they take themselves out of the activities that are potentially going to lead to a fall, um, which means they may not uh, go outside as often. They may not even work around their home. Um, they may sit on the couch more often than, than they had in the past. But when you do that, then you, of course, lose muscle strength, you lose flexibility, your stiffness gets, uh, you get more stiff, and uh, that puts you at a higher risk of falling. So even, you know, when someone's reduced their activity so much, they've really made themselves quite frail and um, potential to fall again is very high. So we do want to teach people uh, how to keep themselves strength and balance, but also the safety measures around reducing their chances of falling. People fall because it's multifactorial. It's a multifactorial issue. So we've talked a little bit about the biological reasons. So if someone has lost strength or they have had an injury, uh, you know, if you have a knee or a hip replacement and you don't do your whole rehab, you have some mismatched strength around the, the, um, the, the new joint. You may have balance issues for lots of different reasons. People uh, start to lose their vision. Their inner ear sometimes causes balance disruptions, never mind weakness. Um, foot problems. Arthritis is a really big thing. If you get up in the morning and you have really sore feet or knees, it's very difficult to walk, pick up your feet, and then potentially tripping on the way to the washroom is very, there's a very high risk for that. So gait changes, of course, we know age is a biological risk factor and seniors do fall, well, you saw one in three over 65, um, but also kids and there are adults in their 30s, 40s and 50s that, that are more prone to falling as well for lots of reasons. So vision and hearing changes and other chronic illnesses. So something like diabetes, for instance, if someone's blood sugar drops or if their heart um, has an arrhythmia, um, or this, the side effects from those medications may cause falls. Those are considered biological risk factors. The environment, the extrinsic environment is another factor for fall uh, risk. So people who live in a state of clutter or who have stairs that are not repaired properly or they don't have handrails, um, any slippery surfaces. So uh, you know, spilling in the bathroom or in the kitchen and not cleaning it up or not seeing where it needs to be cleaned and slipping on that wetness. Um, people who have poor lighting, broken sidewalks, scatter rugs are awful. And, you know, one of the ones I want to add to this is, um, you know, we talk about Winnipeg winters all the time. We don't want to discourage people from being outside, but what can we suggest you know, other than our own strength and fitness to help people outside? Well, we should encourage the use of mobility aids if that's part of what's been prescribed but things like yak tracks or um you know other good shoes even we can we can work on uh, behavioral risk factors um are things like risky behavior and that that's uh that sounds like kind of a funny definition but risky behavior includes things like 80 year olds who still want to get up on a ladder and clean their second floor windows or put up their Christmas lights, or their, um, uh, I worked with a gentleman who liked to race his dog up the stairs and he was in his 80s. Well, you know, that dog's not really thinking of not cutting that gentleman off uh, on the stairs. So that's what I consider risky behavior, or what is considered risky behavior. You know what else is listed on there is carrying a purse. And if you've ever tested the weight of some uh, senior ladies' purses, you'll know that it's an unbalanced load that they're carrying, and that can be a bit risky. So there's a bit of education that can happen there. Now, obviously, alcohol use affects balance, um, poor sleep and nutrition, being sedentary, we've talked about, and that fear of falls comes up again under a behavioral risk factor. And lastly on this list is the social and economic reasons for falling. Now, really, when we think about Someone who lives alone or is socially isolated, if they, if they fall, they may be on the floor for a while until someone finds them. They may not have somebody to call to help them. We may not have someone to call and help them see a, a, a physiotherapist or a doctor if they require assistance for any of the things we've listed before. And those all impact their, their fall risk, as well as having, um, a stairway that needs a handrail or lighting that you are unable to do yourself and you may not be able to pay someone else to do. So there are social and economic risk factors as well. 
Well, our balance is a cool system because it is um, kind of a redundant system. We have three different things that help us with our balance, which is cool because if one of them starts to wane, we have two others that kind of take over. Um, balance is also cool because we can connect with our whole balance internal system, uh, even if we haven't done balance in a while. So I've worked with clients who have um, not work specifically on their balance and as soon as you say okay you know hold on to this chair and try standing on one foot and they're so wobbly if you continue to work in a safe manner on balance the system comes back you can actually rewire your brain and your um, motor neurons your sensory neurons to improve your balance so that's the coolest thing so uh vision affects our balance um our eyes tell us where our head and, and, and body are in space related to our surroundings, our somatosensory receptors or muscle and joint receptors that give feedback to the brain about muscle strength and joint angles. So they are con uh, constantly telling us um, how to, you know, if we start to lean one way, the muscles on the other side of the body start to pull us upright again. Uh, and that that constant feedback is happening. Uh, if someone comes and pushes us from behind, you know, we are able to regain our balance and our, our brain is just firing motor output really quickly to enhance our balance. And then we have the three semicircular canals in our inner ear called our vestibular system that tells us also where our head is um, in comparison. Uh, and, and if you've ever had like an inner ear infection or something that's caused dizziness, Feels a little bit about like uh, feels feels a little bit like being inebriated or being uh, having too much to drink, uh, but that can throw our balance off as well. Um, and so our whole central processing and motor output system slows down with age. Our reaction time, so our ability to actually sense our environment and then react to it. So if we are about to trip, you know, those of us who are under the age of 60, we may be able to re react much faster by, by uh, writing our, ourselves and firing off the muscles that need to help us stay balanced. But where someone who's older, they may feel that trip and before their brain even processes what ha what's happening, they're on the ground. We should do a little bit of assessment for patients, not patients, sorry, clients that may have a fall history. So you may have the type of uh, relationship with someone that you can ask them about their fall history. Ask them if they've ever had a fall, what the circumstances were around that, whether they're supposed to be using mobility aids, if they're scared of falling, what their senses are like, et cetera. We can also um, look at their fall risk from an environmental standpoint. And I did include a link here uh, that is um, a home and environment checklist that uh, you could either go through with a client, you could have them look at themselves. Um, and you know, sometimes people don't realize that scatter rugs or wearing a certain type of shoe is uh, a fall risk. We can encourage our, our clients to get their eyesight checked and you know, I'm at that age where uh, bifocals are something that are tough to get used to. Uh, that's certainly a, a fall risk for sure. I have a pair of glasses that if I look a certain way, curves, uh, something that's not actually curved. And there have been times where I've looked down and I've missed the last step. So eyesight is, uh, is crucial. Medications, uh, encourage your uh, participants, your clients, to put all their medications in a bag and go talk to the pharmacist and say, are any of these uh, putting me at risk of falling or any combination of them? And that includes natural supplements as well. From a nutrition standpoint, that's a, that's a dietitian's job or nutritionist's job. Um, if we have specific certification in, in nutrition, then we can give some advice. But outside of that, making sure that people have enough nutrition to um, be healthy, following the food guide, etc. Um, that's pretty much all we can do. But it is, in some cases, people don't eat for whatever reason, or they um, have a whole load of caffeine or something that might impact their fall, fall, their fall risk, as well as blood pressure. You know, participants should know what their blood pressure is, and there's no reason you can't go into the community and check your blood pressure as well. So a bit of education around what a normal blood pressure looks like is something we can do. Um, I also included on here a few names of gait and balance screening tests, and uh, one of them is called the Timed Up and Go. This is a simple seniors test of fitness test where you place a chair uh, against a wall, just a chair with no arms, well, 
you could have arms on it, I guess, or no arms, and a pylon that's eight feet away, and you, with a stopwatch, you time a person getting up from the chair, walking around the pylon, and coming back and sitting down, and um, seeing how fast they're able to do that. And then you can refer to standards uh, um, scores online for, you know, whether people are at a fall risk or not. There is uh, a little bit of consensus that anybody who takes more than 11 to 14 seconds to go around that pylon is at a higher, for, uh, a higher fall risk. The seniors test of fitness has some basic balance tests such as standing on one foot and, and uh, on different surfaces and we can, um, you can certainly look at those a lot closer. Uh, that's a standard test that's been around for, for many years. And um, the Berg uh, and the Tinetti balance test uh, as well as the uh, mobility uh, test that's number five there. I did want to pull this up now. Give me a moment to, uh, to share my screen here. And I will find what the Berg test looks like, just as an example. Um, the Berg balance scale, here's an example of this has actually been filled out. But for instance, you can give the instruction, whoops, uh, please stand up, try not to use your hands for support. And so if someone's able to stand without using their hands uh, and stabilize themselves, then they get four, four points out of four. If they need moderate or maximal assistance to stand, you actually have to help them up, then they get a zero. Uh, another one is being able to stand two minutes without holding on. That's just standing on two feet. You know, you, you still probably want to put a chair in front of them if they need to hold on. Um, but if you are able to stand for two minutes or um, 30 seconds, et cetera, or unable to stand for 30 seconds, and you get a score. Now, at the end of this test, and there's several different questions on it, as you can see, there is a score range for risk uh, assessment for falling. So you can check out Berg or Tinetti or the Palma test, any of those. Um, are relatively easy to assess one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, in a group, not so easy, but you could uh, have a safe environment where people were timed in trying to stand on one foot, for instance, and you just had a stopwatch um, and said, you know, anyone who, who can hold that uh, stance for 30 seconds, for instance, is, is at a lesser fall risk. So there are ways of assessing groups. Uh, it's a little easier to assess one-on-one. -on -one. I did want to present you a few fall statistics um, and you know a lot of these you may already realize um, but uh, fall injury on snow and ice is a huge problem or stairs. Uh, I did put down on there that there were uh, 1,733 deaths from falls among older Manitobans between the years 2000 and 2012. That's about 133 fall deaths per year and that's absolutely unacceptable. Um, and you've seen the statistic that one third of Canadian adults experience a fall each year. I also wanted to share one more thing with you. And again, I'll just uh, fuss around here for one moment. I have I think I've done it here. There we are. This is called a picto chart. And this is done by the um, Manitoba um, Staying on Your Feet, which is the uh, Winnipeg Regional Health Authority Injury Prevention Population Public Health Department. So just looking at falls are the most expensive injury in our healthcare system. Um, falls cost Canada about $4.4 billion, and they will by 2031 because of our, our large senior population by then. There are lots of healthcare costs associated with, and you can see direct and indirect healthcare costs, as well as hospitalization and unintentional injury. Oops. Um, there were 26,000 hospitalizations for falls between 2000 and 2010. Uh, having said that, um, this is not all seniors, remember, and so this is kids who fall off playground and, uh, playground stuff, et cetera. It costs about almost $7,000 um, for a hospital stay in Winnipeg every year. About 25 days in hospital, you can see here, as well as the cost of specific injuries. So lots of people return home after being hospitalized, but many 
need home care and other support services. So just one more thing here, fall to the leading cause of injury related permanent partial and total disabilities for Manitobans of any age and cost um, Manitoba economy at $844 million per year. So I don't wanna overburden you with statistics, but, um, but I will, <laughs> just kidding. All right, I need to go back to, Pardon me for sharing everything on my computer with you. Okay, and uh, from a Canadian uh, standpoint, the consequences, the economic burden of falls, um, you saw in that chart, $2 billion, fractured hips cost lots of money in Canada. And let, let's not discount bumps and bruises. They can keep people from being comfortable for several days, weeks, uh, being able to do their ADLs or their activities of daily living, getting dressed, going shopping, um, making food, using the washroom. And then that, that fall prediction, uh, being fearful of falls is, is such, a, such a worrisome risk factor. We really need to give people confidence when we're prescribing exercise for them. So the injuries that people look at, there's broken and fractured bones. You can see the percentage there, 37.3, sprains and strains, scrapes and blisters. And then think, well, I mean, 1.7% of falls, concussions and brain injuries, still tragic, but it's uh, not, the, the, not the highest injury that people get. So what can we do to reduce falls? We need to address some of those risk factors. So what can we do with that? First of all, we know that exercise is an effective and well-established intervention. Um, on top of that, we can take any captive audience we want and look at the fall prevention literature and educate them on vision and their environment and safe practices, risky behavior and all that type of thing. Um, there's different levels of, of uh, research on fall prevention and fall reduction. And most of them say um, exercise is minimally helpful. Um, so this study, for instance, looked at multifactorial and multiple component interventions for, for, for preventing falls in older people living in the community. And those multi-component interventions are exercise, uh, fall prevention classes, balance, um, pharma pharmaceutical counseling, et cetera. And the outcome was that they may reduce the rate of falls and risk of falling compared with usual care, which would just be seeing a doctor or attention control, which is paying more attention to your environment. Um, but it doesn't change the fall related outcomes too much. May reduce fall related fractures. So when we look at a, a large database, uh, Cochrane is a, assist, is a database of systematic reviews, which are very high level of research, uh, meta-analysis. Um, so we do trust the, the uh, information that comes out of there, but uh, really the, uh, the bottom line is that nothing that we do hurts, but we're not 100% sure how much it helps. Um, having said that, Often you see in these studies that exercise is still a really good thing to be doing. What's the best mode, the best type of exercise to prevent falls in the community? This is a randomized controlled trial. Um, this was actually a meta-analysis of 108 randomized controlled trials. Overall, there were almost 20, well, 23 and a half thousand participants, different countries, and they were about 76 years old, mostly women. Um, exercise did reduce falls in the community by about 23% compared to people who didn't. And the most important things to include were balance exercises, like specific balance exercises, functional training, so exercises that mimic everyday movements, resistance training, and Tai Chi. And we're going to see Tai Chi pop up quite a few times in this presentation. Um, and there's no evidence in this one that programs that are based on flexibility or, you know, just a walking or a biking program reduced falls. One more Cochrane review to show you uh, looked at 94 randomized controlled trials, 9,000 participants, uh, all living in the community over 60, and they were all women actually. Um, a couple of studies did have nursing home residents, but what they looked at were the interventions and what kind of fall outcomes assessment they improved. 
So if you do an exercise class that includes gait balance coordination and coordination or functional task training, you can improve someone's timed up and go. That should actually say T-U-G, not T-U-B, I apologize. Um, you can improve their ability to stand on one leg and you can improve their Berg scores. Resistance and power training also saw improvements in those tests. Uh, 3D exercises such as Tai Chi, dance, and yoga also improved those tests. Um, walking, cycling, computerized balance training, something like a video game, um, didn't show a whole lot of improvement. So that's there's those endurance exercises. It's kind of confirming that. And a vibration platform. So that's like a, a big scale that vibrates. Um, some of those were came into uh, favor, I guess, uh, when people were looking at bone density improvements several years ago. And so there's a little bit of indication for my vibration platform but um, for bone density, but they did not show any improvements in the um, in, in these studies on balance. Um, and then lastly, multimodal meaning using at least two of the above inter types of interventions. So if we take that information and we apply it to our classes, if we do some balance coordination and functional exercises, if we include some resistance or power training, or we do some Tai Chi dance or yoga, or, or more than two of those things, then we are improving the balance of our participants. Now, all of this depends on the type of person that you, you are working with, the type of, of clients that you have. We may be starting with something like chair Tai Chi with a really low level, or we could be doing really heavy power training with somebody else. Um, and so there's so many more factors that go into prescribing exercise, uh, including improving their fall reduction based on the individual or based on the, on the class that you're teaching. I guess I should mention before I flip slides that overall, um, there's weak evidence that some exercises are moderately effective in improving balance. Um, and in some of those uh, 94 randomized controlled trials, there's a bit of question about the actual quality of the research. However, nothing is negative. So we can always try something. Um, this is just a, a quote from one of the resources that you can look at at the end, that there's mounting evidence from these RCTs that show that falls can be reduced through exercise. Uh, and these are evidence-based, exercise-focused interventions. Uh, unfortunately, we're still at the point of not knowing 100% how we should prescribe exercise to reduce the chance of people falling. We're still looking at a whole bunch of best practice and we don't know exactly what to do. That's why, you know, everything sounds a little bit mushy here on exactly what we should be doing. Uh, so here's the Canadian Physical Activity Guidelines, and you've seen them for uh, older adults, and you've probably seen them for, for those 18 to 64, and they're actually not any different. The 18 to 64 have the exact same um, guidelines, including to achieve health benefits and improve functional abilities. Those 65 and older accumulate 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous uh, exercise per week in bouts of 10 minutes or more. Second point, same as the 18 to 64 year olds, do muscle training, muscle and bone training two days a week, at least two days a week. The one thing that's different for 65 years and older is those with poor mobility should perform physical activities to enhance balance and prevent falls. That's not on the 18 to 64 year old guidelines, but why isn't it? Why shouldn't it be? Um, Grab the next 30 year old you know uh, and get them to stand on one foot, especially if they're not uh, you know, doing regular physical activity. Their balance isn't great. So I would argue that almost everyone needs to be doing balance exercises. And then of course the fourth point being that this is a minimal prescription. People need to remember that. Um, you're gonna see health benefits. There's been enough research over enough number, a number of years that say that 150 minutes of moderate to vigorous a week is enough to see health benefits but you could do way more and see way more benefits. Oops. So if we look at the modes of exercise for balance, there's 
way more factors involved than the list that you're going to see here. You really have to know your clients. You have to know your, your group exercise class members. You have, it has to be fitting into what you're already doing uh, from a, a cardio standpoint. For instance, if you're running an aerobics class, um, you know, maybe you can throw in a bit more dance if your population could, you know, it would be suitable for them. It may not be. But the choose things that are safe. Um, if you have a new group of seniors who have some challenges with mobility, then you're not going to be doing a lot of choreography. You're not going to use a step to increase intensity uh, because there's a fall hazard. There's a risk there. So you really have to know your people and you also have to think about the other conditions that may be affected, you know? Um, same with resistance training. Any resistance training you do will improve your muscle strength and improve your chances of not falling. Uh, lower body and core are a good focus, um, but anything that you do is, is beneficial. And then that balance training in Tai Chi we'll look at more closely. So just as I said, any cardio is good cardio for every other health benefit that people do exercise for. Mental health, physical health, car, you know, endurance, stamina, all that stuff. Um, just making sure that you do what people like to do. And I, on, um, anything that kind of changes your perturbs balance. So if someone has to walk backwards for a few steps in a, in a choreographed class, or if they have to change to moving sideways or be on their tiptoes or something, or in some cases you can set up an obstacle course. And that may mean something completely different from one fitness leader to another. Uh, but you know, it, it may also be really beneficial for certain, for certain clients. So there's some ideas there. And really all you're gonna do is weigh the benefits of the activity to the risk of that person falling uh, to choose the activities that are appropriate. Flexibility doesn't really help balance too, too much, except that uh, the more mobile a joint, the better. So um, we don't do flexibility specifically to enhance our balance. However, if someone has arthritis, maybe they're really limited to the types of exercises they can do to improve their strength uh, and mobility. So flexibility in that case might be the best thing that you can do. Um, so the, the, the one statement I have here that it, it assists in maintaining full range of motion and reduces the chance of injury from a near fall. Um, there are some benefits in doing flexibility there. Muscle strength is the most important thing. Um, Really, we want to make sure that we are are having a really strong, uh, really strong muscles uh, around the ankle, ankle mobility and ankle strength. So lower leg, um, hip, uh, knee, low back, core. Uh, these are the ones that that we should really be focusing on. So uh, you know, almost all of us include a lot of lower body functional movements in our classes to start with, especially when we have seniors in our class. But uh, the, keep on doing these. There's, there's no wrong way of doing strength training for the lower body to improve balance. We might want to think about targeting a gluteus medius a little bit more uh, for hip stability. Um, uh, and maybe we're not um, doing something that, that adds that ex, uh, internal, or that, excuse me, that external rotation, but um, think about gluteus medius as well. Uh, and so we can take any of these exercises and we can modify them if we need to. So uh, if we're doing a, a calf raise is great for ankle strength, for, for, um, for gastro uh, soleus strength. Someone may be able to do them off the edge of a step with no support. That would be a very high functioning individual. Or it could be someone sitting in a chair leaning forward on their knees to add a bit of resistance and then just list um, lifting their heels off the ground. That could be their lower body uh, calf raise. Uh, you could do some leg extension, curl, um, squatting, obviously lunging, very functional, uh, deadlift also, ab adduction. Uh, so focusing on the hip, ankle, uh, trunk, we could do core, core, uh, curls, bridges, um, other back extension, bird dog. You can see the whole list here. Thinking of other um, conditions or abilities of your, of your participants. So um, for instance, for a curl, if you have uh, someone who has low bone density, we don't want them to be in, in flexion 
of their spine, that puts their spine at risk of fracture. But uh, if someone has that not at risk of fracture, they can certainly be doing anything to work on rectus abdominis. Upper body exercises are not as, um, uh, as crucial to balance, uh, but overall strength is going to be an improvement. So we can think of it as, as helping us get up and improving our overall fitness if we work on the upper body as well. So balanced training, the Osteoporosis Society of Canada, OSC, actually suggests 20 to 30 minutes of balanced training every day for people, which sounds really excessive, but if we can manage that, like if you've ever done 30 minutes of balanced training every day for a week, like we're pretty sore after that. Um, there's tons of research on Tai Chi, um, not really good evidence on specific balance training. And there is actually a little bit of a positive evidence about aquatic training um, on improving ankle and knee stability. So we could try any of that. We can um, put five minutes into a class. We could put 10 minutes into a class. We could try some Tai Chi or learn some Tai Chi and teach it. Um, we can look at some specific balance training exercises. So here is a list of potential balance exercises for everybody. Um, I'm going to try and demonstrate some of these for you. And so we could do anything from, uh, you know, a seated position, for instance. We can have somebody sitting in a chair and we could have them leaning, right, right from the hip or we could have their hands up to change their center of gravity. We could have them reach forward. Um, you can't see my feet right now, but you could certainly move your feet a little bit further apart, uh, or, and that would make you more balanced, or together, or lift one leg off and just try and hold that core. So we could even do something uh, sitting on a sit fit, one of those cushions, or actually even any, any cushion that does, is not a solid base would help with core. Then we can progress. Pardon the noise. We can progress to, thank you for your, your patience, uh, just standing on two feet. We could bring our feet together. We could stand up on our toes. Um, we could uh, stand in a tandem stance. So that's, that is like this, heel to toe, or a modified tandem stance, which is heel to toe, but with your feet a little bit apart. Um, we could also use a chair and hold on tight with both hands, stand on one foot, we could move that leg around a little bit if we wanted to. We could change how much we were holding on to the chair. We could even try, you know, you, uh, you may not be able to see, I apologize, but just trying with two fingers on a chair or one hand while we're standing on one foot. So that's reducing the contact with our hands. We can also change the center of mass by holding our hands up over our head, for instance. Or again, we could try reaching or with one hand down. Um, we may want to try closing our eyes or um, closing one eye. We could certainly take shoes off of people and have them stand in their bare feet or stand on a cushion or a softer surface like a, um, a blanket and try their balance this way. And of course, you can always have the option of holding on. You can also do some dynamic balance, so things like shifting side to side, and remember again that chair could be right in front of you, or dynamic balance where you're stepping forward and stepping back, and trying to hold those for, for a moment. That's a sway. Um, you can also just have people walking backwards, either tandem or a normal step or sideways, it could be navigating obstacles, or you could add a cognitive challenge or something that makes, um, takes their mind off of their bodies while they're doing their balance. So you could have them do a balance exercise and then count backwards from 100 by threes or something like that. 
The last couple lists are uh, on our list here. You could have someone trying to balance something while they're balancing, so that's a multimodal task. And of course, you're, this is a, a progression. We're gonna start at the top and work our way down. And even at the bottom, we can make things harder. What if you did a multimodal task, so if you're holding a tray with ping pong balls while tandem walking with one eye open. So that's a very special participant, but it's a possibility in terms of balance training. The last one on this list is a perturbation, and I can't really show you, but having someone stand uh, on one foot and then giving them a nudge or nudging them one way and having them keep their balance. And you can also, you can use BOSUs or um, foam rollers or half foam rollers or those types of things. So there's so many different things that you can add into your class, depending on your class, depending on your equipment, depending on your room, depending on your level of comfort and safety. Uh, but I mean, I've worked with many seniors and if you can have them near a wall, they can stand on one foot relatively safely. Um, if not, they, they, there's corners. Sometimes people can be seated in corners. You can certainly use exercise balls. Even seating on a, sitting on an exercise ball with no movement is still a core and balance exercise. I did want to point out on here that the Manitoba Fitness Council has a YouTube channel and they have many ex excellent examples of balance exercises. So the link is there. And you can scroll down, there's a, one called narrowing the base, there's one called altering your vision, et cetera. Lots of nice fun ideas for balance. So you could actually have a class that was just balance. Uh, and you may be able to sell that in your community. <clears throat> but most of us would integrate balance into our regular classes. So we may have just a regular multimodal exercise for every fitness component and we throw balance in there. Um, because you're using small supporting muscle and soft tissue, if you're doing a specific balance class, you probably don't wanna do one for more than about 30 minutes, three times a week. And I should have mentioned earlier that almost all of those exercise interventions in that research, they were done for 30 minutes, three times a week. Um, so including, if, if you only have a, a class where you see people once a week, you could certainly encourage them to be doing some balance at home safely uh, the other days. So you could specifically spend time on balance before or after your strength training or after your cardio, or you could even integrate it into your strength training. So standing on one foot, for instance, while you're doing a bicep curl. Or uh, harder would be uh, standing on one foot while you're doing a shoulder raise, because that center of gravity is you know, moving quite, you have quite a bit of change in your center of gravity. Um, in the last couple of slides, I wanted to show you this one. This is another piece of research I found um, about how do seniors feel about participating in a fall prevention intervention. And this was um, the, an outcome. This was a, kind of a summary of studies, of 24 studies that asked seniors about their feelings about the, when they were in their fall prevention programs. There are facilitators and there are barriers. And the things that help seniors enjoy a fall prevention intervention are things like social support. So how do we improve social support? We know that social support is, is crucial for most exercise classes anyways. So we get to know our participants, we know their names, we might know a little bit about them, we encourage them to chat with each other, we might have some social activities, we do partner work. So all this social support is a facilitator for balance training. Another one is to offer low intensity exercise. So um, I think most people want to be sure that they're not going to hurt themselves when they go to a program. So just having different um, intensities available for your participants. You might want to have a, a higher intensity option or a lower intensity option. So just like I showed you with the balance, you can do this holding on or not holding on. Um, Seniors love education. Tell them why they're doing it. Talk about the redundant balance system. Talk about their vestibular system and, and their muscle strength and that type of thing. Uh, involve them in some decision making. Ask, do you want to do this exercise or this exercise? Now, we can't always leave the options open. We have to plan our class. But people do like to have some control over their, their environment. And they certainly like to have control in their exercise class. Um, and the other thing we can do is just make sure that they understand that this is a relevant thing. They need to learn 
um, their bodies need to be able to be balanced because of the safety uh, around it. And saying that one in three Canadians over 65 falls, that should be part of it, right? Uh, in the winter, we can sell this in Winnipeg in the winter with, with very little problem. Some of the barriers that seniors didn't want to participate or didn't enjoy it, uh, participating in fall prevention interventions were fatalism. So fatalism means uh, people have the attitude that whatever, if I fall, I fall, whatever happens, happens. That people might deny or underestimate their risk of falling. Um, you have some people that say, you know, I've been an athlete all my life, I'm perfectly fine. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes that, that translates into some risky behavior and, and, an, and an injury or two. Some people have poor self-efficacy. They think that no matter what they do, it's not going to actually help, so they don't bother. They may ne have never exercised and don't know the benefits. They might be fearful of falling, um, have poor health and low functional ability. We know that those are barriers to any exercise participation. And they also may have a stigma associated with seniors exercise programming. So keep that in mind, depending on the population you're trying to sell this course to or this class to, maybe it's not called balance for seniors. Maybe it's something much more fun, um, much more dynamic. Uh, it might, uh, what if it's multi-generational or something really fun like that, you know, balancing with your grandkids or that type of thing. So, the, keep in mind the facilitators and the barriers uh, when you're planning a class and, and how you want to sell that class. If you are interested in further information, first of all, there's no end to research and I do have some uh, re references I'll show you at the end. But there is an actual Manitoba, excuse me, Canadian Falls Prevention Curriculum that is run, has been developed by Dr. Vicki Scott uh, from UBC. And you can, like I say, you can get certified in, uh, in the false prevention curriculum. I did put the cost down there, just sometimes cost is a deterrent. It's not too, too bad, but um, that's uh, dependent on the person. There's lots of, there's, uh, lots of information that you don't have to pay for. Uh, and again, I, I refer you to my references. But the other place that has a lot of information is Osteoporosis Canada. And they have a whole uh, advocacy program called Too Fit to Fall or Fracture. And the link is there. They have lots of online resources. So I don't have the opportunity to answer your questions because we're not live. However, I did put my email down and feel free to contact me. Um, it's been wonderful to share some information for you. I can help you integrate some balance in fall prevention and fall reduction exercises into your classes if you'd like. Um, otherwise, I'm going to sign off saying thank you very much for listening. Uh, I have my references that are going to come up for the next couple moments on the program before it ends. But uh, everybody have a great day and thank you very much for uh, listening.